Well, I have to say uh, thank you for that, that uh, introduction. And uh, there's a lot of afores going on now, so I'm starting to feel a little, uh, a little old. Uh, <laughs> long in the tooth, that's work. Um, but also that 2021 um, uh, recognition was so nice. And um, I have to admit, um, uh, this is the first chance I've been in, in physical proximity to you. Thank you for it, uh, Chris, as well. Uh, because it was COVID, and uh, the ceremony was on Zoom, um, which unfortunately you know, kept us from, from being able to celebrate correctly. Uh, Do I have a clipper up here, uh, just for the slides? I think there's a slide coming up for me. Oh, they'll do it for me. Okay, so I'll just say next slide. How about that? Uh, easy enough. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just um, a sort of uh, panel of questions that come up around XR technologies with regard to uh, tech policy, just as a way of, in, in, in effect, setting up the panel discussion that we're going to have, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, um, which is just a GIF, or GIF. Uh, Alyssa won't tell me which one's which. Uh, but it's Flag Day! Uh, so happy Flag Day to all those who celebrate. But on to the next slide very quickly, please. Um, tech Policy Press, I'll just say a quick word on to the next slide. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to provide analysis. You can click on the next slide. Um, analysis, uh, perspective, uh, debate, discussion around these intersections of, uh, of tech and democracy. Um, and, you know, uh, it is a moment of great challenge around the world, certainly in this country uh, and elsewhere. And we'll go on to the next slide. Um, this is a chart that I saw presented uh, recently uh, by Dr. Alondra Nelson, uh, you know, former uh, uh, director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, now at Johns Hopkins, um, who I know many of you are, are well familiar with. Um, this is intended to depict all the world's problems, the kind of interconnected uh, issues that we have from climate on through to uh, economic inequality, on through to uh, public health challenges, on through to uh, you know, range of warfare and, and international conflict. If you go on to the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, up on the top left-hand corner, uh, they've got this little section that sort of looks like the stuff we're talking about today. Um, it's a, the questions around adverse outcomes of frontier technologies and breakdowns of critical information infrastructure, problems of mis and disinformation, uh, questions around cybercrime and cyber insecurity. Um, what I liked about the way uh, Dr. Nelson uh, talked about this is she said, you know, this is a, a chart that's been put out by the World Economic Forum. It's supposed to depict what's called the poly crisis, uh, which is an old term, but been around for a while. Uh, but has come back into, into uh, some, uh, uh, some popularity. Um, she said, you know, this is the wrong way to think about tech and its relationship to the problems that we have. It's not a separate set of problems that are sort of off to the side. Uh, in fact, it's, they're in conversation with, they're underneath, they are the medium uh, in some cases for some of these problems. And certainly they are, uh, you know, affecting and, and interacting with and otherwise having an effect on the degree and severity, uh, and in some cases, the, the, the actual specifics of those problems. Um, this is maybe somewhat reminiscent of some of the things that uh, Dick Reisman was saying a little bit earlier about uh, the reflexive nature of, of tech and, and the way that it impacts society. Um, so I kind of come to Tech Policy Press with this, uh, and, and when I, you ask me about any technology, whether it's AI or XR, I sort of think about it through this lens. I, I, I really very much buy that perspective. We'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, and I think uh, I'll just throw out, since uh, Lisa mentioned I, I work uh, as a professor at NYU as well, I teach this course, Tech, Media, and Democracy. Uh, a paper I always give my students these days is this one, uh, which was written by a bunch of different academics and led by a, a friend of mine called Joe Bach Coleman, a paper called Stewardship of Global Collective Behavior. Um, and the paper kind of tries to step back for a second sort of look down almost on, on the species from the moon and sort of ask, like, what is it we're doing here, right? Uh, why are we on the planet, um, you know, building these communications technologies, etc. cetera? Uh, and a lot of the experts that are on the paper are, they're not necessarily technology experts. They're people who study information. They study how species interact with one another. They study locusts and fish and birds and ants. Uh, and, you know, they're basically making this argument that and, you know, there's a lot of systems uh, by which the species has learned to communicate over, over the millennia, over the eons, uh, that are kind of baked in evolutionarily. Uh, and we've perturbed that 
in the last few decades. We've perturbed that uh, with the introduction of digital communications technologies. In some cases for the better, in some cases for the worse. Uh, but their point is that this should be treated as a kind of crisis discipline. Uh, a crisis discipline similar to climate science. That it's something that's exceedingly important that we've done uh, on this planet. And we don't understand its implications. We don't understand the impact. Um, so when I kind of think about XR and I think about uh, any emerging technology, I tend to kind of put it through this lens, right? What, what's going to be uh, ultimately the impact on the species? How are we going to understand uh, the way in which it will affect our, our patterns of beliefs and behavior? Uh, so go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so what's that XR got to do with all this? Um, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. There's one more GIF. Um, some of you will know uh, Sutherland's uh, Sword of Damocles. Looks funny when reduced to a GIF, but you know, this is 1969, right? This is the first, uh, essentially, um, uh, uh, you know, what we might think of as a modern headset. Uh, we, I think it, Dick may recall the exact bit rate, not because you were there, Dick, but uh, the exact uh, you know, uh, amount of data that this thing was uh, capable of, of, of producing. Um, but we're essentially talking about a sort of stereoscopic display that was able to put some information in front of the, the viewer's retina. And on to the next slide. Uh, in some ways, things haven't changed all that much uh, on, on some level when it comes to XR. Uh, it's still more or less the same form factor. Uh, we're still asking some of the same questions about the clunkiness and should it have a cord and be connected and what do we do about the battery and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but certainly something very different is going on under the hood in terms of the experience that the users have. On to the next slide, please. Um, so at Tech Policy Press, we've tried to cover this in a bunch of different ways. Um, and uh, this is a, a, just a post that came out of a, a big symposium I had the opportunity to attend and participate in. Uh, it was led by Britton Heller out of Stanford last year. There were a bunch of different good ideas uh, that people were trying to kind of put forward uh, around questions around extended reality and law, questions around extended reality and policy there. Um, on to the next slide. And the question really has been, what's well, different? about this technology versus other uh, digital media and communications technologies. Um, and I think during the course of that day and then kind of subsequent uh, conversation with the various authors, um, there were a bunch of different things we kind of came up with, uh, but they kind of boiled down to, to these four bullets. Um, so questions around, uh, you know, what these new sensors uh, in these devices mean, what new data they generate, uh, the types of new privacy concerns, um, that they will, will ultimately um, uh, deliver. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're utilizing visual perception, psychology in new ways uh, with these, these interfaces. We are uh, capable of enchanting and subtly manipulating users in ways that perhaps in other digital media communications technologies uh, we've not been able to do. Uh, there's certainly a kind of uh, capability towards identifiability of sensor data um, the ability to kind of uh, track gait and uh, track emotion, track movement in extraordinary ways through four dimensions. Um, and, and then, you know, this sort of question about where, where do the sensors stop? stop when we talk about XR? Are we talking about uh, neuro rights now? Are we talking about brain-computer interfaces, neural interfaces, which if you haven't seen demonstrated are extraordinary. Um, one of the few kind of like wow moments I've had uh, in technology I feel like over the last two years, everybody can think of one or two they've had, was trying the Control Labs uh, prototype, uh, ultimately sold to Facebook, the neural interface that they developed for the wrist. It takes a signal out of the wrist and then allows you to control, you know, of course, uh, the computer uh, simply, uh, ultimately, by thinking about it. Um, you know, this raises so many different uh, types of considerations around privacy. Do we have the right definitions uh, around biometric privacy, legal classifications? Uh, do we know what to do when it comes to uh, things like the Wiretapping Act, the Stored Communications Act? Uh, how will those apply inside of, of these environments? Um, how will XR ultimately be a tool for law enforcement? Um, how will we think about its you know, Fourth Amendment uh, uh, implications, jurisprudence, jurisprudence implications. Um, how does GDPR handle uh, XR? Uh, and some of the questions around sensitive data. We have the right sensitive data categories uh, when it comes to these things. Uh, 
Um, and then, you know, another set of questions about the extent to which we may see these technologies kind of create the opportunity, uh, new ways for people to, to harm one another. Um, there's a lot of discussion of that at that symposium and in the pages of Tech Policy Press since. Uh, we've tried to get into questions around virtual violence and harassment. Um, what do virtual actions uh, mean with regard to the impact on the person? There's some science that suggests that if you are harassed or assaulted in a virtual or digital environment, it can have very much the same psychological impact on you as if it happened in the real world. Well, of course, uh, that's, that's uh, complicated for a bunch of reasons legally. Um, we don't know exactly how to uh, pursue these types of crimes. There are lots of jurisdictional issues um, and a lot of questions about uh, you know, the extent to which uh, law enforcement agencies would even be able really to pursue these types of things. Um, then we get to AI. Um, there's been a topic of conversation certainly in the Congresswoman's talk just now. Um, the intersection of AI and XR. Uh, the idea that AI-generated content will populate these environments. A lot of folks think that, in fact, that's the thing XR has been waiting for, is this sort of generative media uh, uh, capability, to get this opportunity to generate you know, uh, uh, both conversation, uh, new entities, to literally be able to speak into being uh, anything visually in three dimensions or four dimensions that I might like. We are at that moment now. Um, so, uh, questions around intellectual property and copyright uh, that come in with that reality, right? Um, if I'm um, developing new, new digital items or properties or objects or experiences or places, uh, to whom do I owe uh, the credit? Uh, so, enormous numbers of, of kind of promise and peril when it comes to, to these technologies. And then another thing I think, uh, just kind of going back again to stewardship of global collective behavior, so a set of questions about what is the implication on the species of what we do here? Um, you may have noticed that Silicon Valley companies don't necessarily always have the best track record when it comes to rolling out new products and services in terms of uh, you know, whether or not those services are ready or safe or prime time. We've seen some good examples of this recently. You know, the race to push out these artificial intelligence uh, platforms and services. Uh, we've seen some, some pretty extraordinary missteps by companies that appear to be, you know, very much uh, trying to uh, beat one another without much concern uh, about whether these tools may lead to unintended harm or consequences. Um, so this kind of question about when it comes to XR, what are the uh, kind of set, you know, um, uh, criteria for public release, right? If we put a new brain computer interface out into the market, um, how do we know that that thing will be safe, uh, both in, in, in application uh, and ultimately uh, in the long run in terms of, of, of the way that it affects uh, the human uh, experience. Um, do we need kind of new types of ethical considerations? Do we need uh, a kind of Belmont approach uh, you know, uh, of principles for the way we introduce digital media technologies? Um, do we need a HIPAA for, for developers of, uh, of, of these types of technologies? Um, we've already seen some of these types of considerations. Uh, when it comes to medical applications of XR, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has already reviewed and authorized uh, many XR-based medical devices. But what happens, or what do we do with everything that's sort of below that threshold um, that may promise that it can offer us therapy or offer us uh, some sort of uh, even clinical, uh, potentially, benefit? Um, so a huge number of questions that I think um, are before us with XR that are different, uh, I think, from, from just kind of digital technology that we've become familiar with over the last few decades. Um, and I think that's what this panel is going to be about. Um, it's a good moment for me to have to, to transition to it. Um, so I'm going to, I think, uh, hit one more slide. I've got one more slide. I've got, so if you go and you can just cycle through these slides quickly. If you want to read more about these things, uh, I'd recommend you uh, come to the page of the Tech Policy Press um, and you can, you can find uh, various discussion of this stuff going forward. Um, I think uh, I've left, oh, I, I will point out this one. Uh, we, we may get to this in the panel, but um, one of the, the things I wanted to kind of leave you with today, uh, Colorado having just passed the, the first law amongst the U.S. states uh, extending privacy rights to, to, uh, to neural data first kind of uh, brain-computer interface uh, uh, privacy-oriented uh, legislation in the country. 
Um, I think that is a sort of signal of something that's happening. Uh, going forward, Colorado also just passed an AI Act um, that some of you be familiar with. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on in the, the, the kind of you know, high altitudes of Colorado, but they uh, appear to have an interest in these technologies. Um, my email address is here. Um, if you want to contest something I've said or uh, write about these issues for Tech Policy Press, I hope you will uh, get in touch. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to uh, invite my panel to come join us on the stage.